All right. So everyone, please welcome Stefan Kinsella. He is an IP lawyer, a ANCAP, and an author. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about yourself to anyone who is not familiar with you? Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm from Louisiana. I live in Texas, uh, Houston. I'm a, a libertarian uh, writer for a long time, an Austrian anarchist and a uh, Rothbardian, and also I'm a patent attorney. Awesome. Um, and so in uh, two days, you're going on the uh, Austrian economic server. Is that correct? And you're doing the, that event that they have going on over there with uh, Jeff Dice. Yeah. Correct. That's going to be a really good event, guys. Make sure you all tune into that. I think it's like uh, on the 8th. So that's two days from now. Um, and so. Yeah, there's a link on my website uh, under stephankinsella.com slash, I think, media or events, something like that. And um, there's six or seven people from the Mises Institute, uh, like Patrick Newman and uh, Deist and me and um, Peter Klein, I think, some others. So it should be fun. Yeah, that server, uh, they're, they're buddies with us. Uh, we kind of advertise to those events. Uh, should be a fun time. So um, we're going to get started with a, a layup question because I know what your answer is going to be, but we'll go ahead and uh, give you an opportunity to explain which is better, Austrian or Chicago school. <laughs> uh, well, I happen to be interested in economics, so um... – uh, I prefer real economics to uh, pseudoscience and superstition. So Austrian. Austrian is realistic, and Austrian economics is the right way to approach it, I believe, and it's a solid foundation of it. In today's Misesian version, as, as further developed by uh, Rothbard, Hoppe, and other scholars associated with the Mises Institute, um, is the branch of Austrian economics, which I think has uh, most um, – has best uh, uh, systematized and defined and uh, improved <clears throat> in a more rigorous form, sort of kind of the original insights of economics, which had sort of uh, deductive reasoning and starting from some kind of common sense assumptions about the way human action works. So yeah, I think the problem with Chicago economics uh, is primarily methodological. So they're trying to ape the methods of the science of the natural sciences because they don't understand um, that we have two realms of phenomena that that we seek to understand in the world, and you need different mental approaches for those. And one is the causal realm, which is the study of laws of cause and effect. And the other is the teleological realm, which is the study of the implications of human action, which is humans that have means and goals, and they choose – uh, different means to achieve different ends that they choose to pursue. So there's totally different ways of analyzing this. And when you try to make economics more quote scientific by aping the methods of the natural sciences, you're used, you're just using the wrong tool for the problem. And uh, then you start thinking of this idealized notion of the market as having perfect competition, which is unrealistic, and instant transfer uh, communication of knowledge, which is not realistic, no transaction costs, which is unrealistic. So then you look at the real world and you say, oh, well, there's market failure. So even though the free market's generally good, we need the government to step in and to fix these problems with interventions, which really just make the problem worse. And the, the Chicago and the uh, school um, and most of the other schools of economics uh, have fall fallacious views of, of value. So they think that the, they basically have some version of the labor theory of value, which is wrong. And ultimately, they don't understand that the individual is the sole actor and economic value and action is driven by the subjective preferences of the individual. And that simply means that that preferences and utility is not a cardinal, numerical, measurable quantity that you can compare as between persons, and then you can't sum it up and maximize it with utilitarianism, which is what all these other schools of uh, seek to do so. Austrianism re re views uh, understands that uh, uh, that value is subjective, and it's 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 uh, ordinal, not cardinal, and it's not interpersonally comparable. Um, so yeah, I think that um, yeah, Austrianism I would choose over over anything else. Yeah, we just hosted a debate about this with uh, Walter Block and David Friedman, and it was really uh, interesting. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I, I I talked to David David Friedman. I talked to him at Libertopia back in 2010, I believe, and you know he he's this uh, he was influential to me. He helped me become an anarchist uh, with his book, The Machinery of Freedom. But 
you know, his whole approach to economics is basically uh, the Chicago stuff and uh, his dad's approach, po uh, logical positivism, which is eviscerated by Mises and, and Rothbard and Hoppe, by the way, in their writings. And, uh, you know, Friedman is supposed to be some anarch great anarchist thinker, but he's not even – to my mind, you can't be really a solid libertarian anarchist thinker if you're not good on the major issues. I mean, let's say you're for taxation or the drug war or legislation. You can't be an anarchist. I mean, they seem to require legislatures in the state. And Friedman is ambivalent about intellectual property, and like you cannot be. And the reason he is is because he's Chicago, and he doesn't really have this principled understanding of property rights. It, um, um, and he told me – so I, I made some comment to him that, well, one, one, one fallacy of the arguments for IP is this utilitarian thing that you can sum up utility, and Austrians have shown that you can. He says, well, von Neumann, you know, von Neumann showed that you can actually – so he's got this abstract thing where some kind of – some kind of academic says that there's a way you could sum up utility, which I think is complete bullshit. Um, this reminds me of the debate between uh, Mises and Lang in the 30s about when, when Mises started showing that socialism is impossible. You can't have rational economic planning without real market prices in the means of production, which requires a free market and private property rights. And the response of the socialists was, well, we just need a committee or a bureau to set prices, and they just need the right equations. And if they had a supercomputer, they could do it, You know, like all this nonsense, which people still believe to this day. One day we'll have computers powerful enough to let us have centrally planning, centrally planned, uh, to have a central plan, a centrally planned economy that is efficient. Um, yeah, it's never going to work. All right. Uh... Uh, so, uh, so our next, the next guest we're going to have on is Michael Humer. Do you have any thoughts on him? He's an, he's another anarchist libertarian who is not, um, who's, who's not, um, made his mind up or solid about IP Jan Lester being another one. Um, he's actually pro IP for in, totally incoherent reasons in his book against Leviathan, uh, because he has a, a bad foundation for libertarian theory. He, he, he opposes justificationism, which basically is the principal way of looking at property rights, and he opposes utilitarianism to his credit. So he comes up with a third thing, which is this Popperian idea of conjecturalism, <laughs> and that leads him down this weird middle road path, which leads him to think that the essential libertarian principle is not don't aggress, but don't impose, whatever the hell that means. And he works that into this thing where if you, if you, if you copy what someone else did, then you're imposing on them or something, so it's ridiculous. Uh, Michael Humer is uh, is solid as far as I can tell. He's very smart. Um, I think he's some kind of intuitionist, which, and I haven't read a lot of that. Um, I think there may be some common ground there, uh, but the fact that he's not interested in and hasn't come down – like uh, it should be obvious to any principled, intelligent, comprehensively thinking libertarian thinker. Um, that intellectual property is completely incompatible with um, justice and private property rights, especially if you're an anarchist, because if you understand anything about law, you understand that certain types of laws can only arise from legislation. They don't, they cannot and have not ever emerged in an organic form in a decentralized or common law system, which is the only type of law you could ever have in a, in a, in a just libertarian society. You can't have legislation because legislation requires a legislature. That's just a branch of the state. You can't have a state. So for humor not to understand that, um, that, um, that intellectual property, patent and copyright specifically, <clears throat> are purely creatures of legislation and you know, he's a, uh, I would think he's opposed to legislation if he's an anarchist. So it should be obvious, but it's not. I mean, Hoppe, Hoppe, for example, because Hoppe was so steeped in Austrian methodology and, and Mises thinking about scarcity and also the radical libertarian politics of Rothbard, uh, before he even met me or heard about intellectual property in, back in 1988. Now, I didn't even start writing on this until 1993 or something. Um, so in 88, he was on a panel with David Gordon and, um, and uh, Leland Jaeger and Rothbard. At the Mises Institute, and someone asked him, "What about property rights in information and ideas?" And Hoppe instantly said, "Well, the information is what guides your action, um, but you you have a property right in scarce resources that you control to achieve results of action, but you can't own information. Anyone can freely use information once they learn about it, 
and they can use it without a conflict with someone else. So because his whole uh, political theory is grounded in Austrian economics, the the emphasis on scarcity and the praxeological understanding of the means, ends, way that action works, um, he instantly saw this. Um, so I would think any anarchist who understands that the state is illegitimate and therefore legislatures can't exist, therefore you can't have legislation, if they just understand that the patent and the copyright act are legislation, they would instantly condemn it. So why humor doesn't, I don't know. Otherwise, I like the guy. I just wish he would uh, – we need every principled, serious, influential libertarian thinker, especially anarchist, to come out against all the big harms of the state. Which are war, the drug war, government school, um, the central bank, uh, welfare, which I think humor and all these guys oppose. But intellectual property is up there, like it's in the top five or six or seven horrible things the government does. So to be to be weak on that issue or wobbly on that issue is inexcusable, in my opinion. It would be a good example is like healthcare. It's very hard to defend intellectual property when it comes to healthcare. So I feel like that that's kind of a a softball uh, thing. So I agree with you. So you think that not being an Austrian kind of s- sort of a uh, yes, it's that line of I, thinking. I I mean I, there are solid libertarians who are not Austrian, but I really think that um, and I'm not a thicker, so I don't think you have to be culturally conservative or an American or born in the certain year or speak English or or you know be married. <laughs> Or be Christian or whatever. I don't think those things are essential. You know, libertarianism and, and economics are separate disciplines. But as a practical matter, to really have a good grasp of political theory, you need to know something about history. You need to know something about economics um, and logic and reason. And um, and uh, I, I find that understanding the core. Misesian understanding of, of, of praxeology and Austrian economics is crucial and essential to really getting a good grasp on political theory and libertarian theory. Right. So this is a question is, what do you think of natural law? And I think another question is, do you prefer argumentation ethics to, uh, to natural law? Well, I, I, in one in one sense, yes. Uh, in another sense, uh, I admire and feel like I'm allies with the natural law people because they're basically rooted in a more or less correct understanding of the naturalness of the system that we need for human prosperity to to be achieved. Um, there are some logical problems and a few other problems with the natural law argument, which Hoppe has identified. Um, one would be <clears throat> The, the 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 is ought gap that Hume identified, which is that you can't logically deduce or reason from an assertion or a recognition of the state of affairs, which is a factual or empirical matter, an is statement, to an ought or normative statement. You can't go from an is to an ought. Every time you try to do that, as Hume pointed out, you smuggle in a norm. So when you say, because people are like this, they should do this, whatever should you're saying, you're really – implicitly resting upon an earlier uh, uh, unstated norm. So you might as well make it explicit, and then either you just agree conventionally that everyone in this community agrees on this just arbitrarily or just because we're all similar enough to agree we have these shared values, which I call grun norms after Hans Kelsen, the legal theorist, basic norms, norms at the bottom, um, or you point to certain basic norms that are so core to the argumentative enterprise, the rational enterprise, the discursive enterprise, that they're basically practically undeniable, and that's what Hoppe does. Um, so – and the second problem with natural law is that, um, as some people point out, uh, you know, human nature is very amorphous and plastic and diverse and uh, has changed – has, I won't say it's changed over time, but it varies from culture to culture, from person to person. So it's not you, – you can only get so many sp- – specificities or specific norms out of that, even if you ignore the is ought problem. Like any norms you get out of human nature as a general thing are very, very broad. Like, you know, the Aristotelian idea that you should choose to flourish. Okay, that's fine. I agree with that. Um, 
I don't think I don't I think you can get around that with the by by assuming some some lower norms like once you've chosen to live then you've you've accepted a, a baseline norm of survival and if you're going to survive as a man you should survive as a man and that means flourishing and that's kind of stuff but it only gets you so far I mean it's not it's not going to get you to the to the idea that you, no one should use a condom right which is what Robert Anton Wilson a kind of a semi I think he was a libertarian anarchist kind of guy sci-fi writer he sort of parodied mocked the natural law ideology unfairly to an extent because he equated it with the catholic church and i think his book was called um natural law or don't put a rubber on your willy so he basically was making fun of of the idea that natural law can give you specific things like you should not use birth control um which he's got a point that if you take natural law to um to uncritically then you will you know you will start to just take your 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 particular religions uh mores and values and you will just say that they're natural law but there you really can't deduce from human nature to say that no one should use birth control so there is a danger in relying too much on natural law because it tends to basically just uh congeal and and support the customs people happen to have had like every, every a lot of cultures do this, you know. Whatever your culture happens to be, you tend to think it's the best, but it's just the way you do it. There's lots of human diversity and and, and um, ways of doing things. I think a better uh, a more uh, a better uh, comparison would be like if you compared objectivism to the state church, because uh, it's kind Correct. of correct. Like, objectivists yeah. objectivists do something similar. You know, they they take Ayn yeah. Rand's personal predilections and preferences. And they felt they felt compelled to elevate them to some kind of universal statement. You know, uh, a couple of times they pushed back, like you know, after she died, Peter Peikoff said, "Well, when she said that a woman should not be president because psychologically they're not fit to be a leader," he said that was just her personal. Uh, as a woman, that was her personal preference to have a man be the dominant one in a relationship. She didn't just she didn't like. To imagine a female as president because she didn't think they're psychological. And he said well, that's not part of objectivism. But th they, they didn't do that all the yeah. time. You know, they uh Rachmaninoff is evil and bait and, and uh, uh I forgot who she liked, but you know, some music is evil and some is not. You know, um, um, African music is horrible and jazz is I, I don't know, you know, cats are great and dogs are horrible, <laughs> whatever their capes are good and smoking is good. And so you got to be careful not to elevate your personal preferences into some kind of universal objective thing that everyone needs to follow. Yeah, it's kind of just uh, a bit strange. Um, so what do you think about uh, trans, uh, transcendental idealism? You'd have to define that for me. I'm not sure I know what you're referring to. I'm not sure either, to be honest. I'm going to have to have him come back. And, uh, I mean, tra himself, transcendental, yeah. uh, that, that may be a certain subset of philosophy, um, uh, some philosophical idea. I mean, I know that the word transcendental is sometimes used for the type of argument Papa gives in his argumentation ethics, by which we mean um, an argument that uh, basically you can demonstrate that it's that it's uh, apodictically true because to deny it would involve you in some kind of contradiction. Okay, so it's a method of establishing some assertion is or proposition as being true, uh, but I'm not sure if that's the same thing as transcendental idealism itself. Uh, if uh, idealism as a philosophical epistemological matter, I disagree with. I, I'm, a, I'm a realist uh, along the lines of um, of some of Rand's writing and David Kelly's writing. Um, I'm certainly a realist. I, I'm not a Kantian idealist, if, if that's what they're getting at. Um, now, um, as Hoppe has pointed out, Kant has been sort of unfairly criticized by Rand and others as being an idealist because they're – but he said, on the other hand, the criticism is a little bit fair because uh, Kant's writing is so murky that you can forgive people for getting it wrong and trying to guess what he actually meant. But Hoppe's point, I think, has been that in America, the Kantian scholars in America tended to interpret him in, a, in an idealistic direction, which Rand was right to criticize, I, in my opinion. Um, but in the continent, in Europe, um, the interpretation of Kant is more realistic, and I think that's what Mises does and Hoppe does. So they take a core of Kantian approach to the synthetic a priori and deductive reasoning and this kind of stuff. They use it in a very commonsensical, pra practical way, 
combining it with praxeological insights of Mises to result in a realistic view of the world, which I think is actually compatible with Ayn Rand's realism and David Kelly's realism, just they use different terminology. Yeah, this guy says it's uh, it's Schopenhauer's version of uh, German idealism. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know I'm not, more, I'm not really more than what I've, what I've said. Um, I'm not a philosopher. Yeah. My son is a, st a student of philosophy. Maybe he can someday figure this out. <laughs> yeah, um, so this is oddly specific. So I, I have no idea what's on, what's on this page. But he asked for your, pay, your thoughts on page 173 of Democracy, the God That Failed. Do you have it in front of you? No, I have no idea. I was like, maybe that's a famous page or something. I have no idea. Um, my guess is it's some kind of quote about homosexuals or something, covenant communities. I, I don't know. I, I, he seems like an intelligent guy, so probably not. ask him. Ask him to give a quote, and you can read the quote, and I can yeah, comment on it. If you give a quote, we can we can. Want to come back to it if yeah. he writes? Yeah, he seems intelligent, so it's probably something good. Uh, so, um, do you have any upcoming books? Well, I am working something I've been working on for 14 years. I'm I'm I'm, I'm determined to get it out. The anti-fascist mob. Right, that's my hopper ringtone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm determined to get a book out uh, this year, and I think I will in the next six months um, uh, or nine months. It, it'll be uh, Law in a Libertarian World. It'll be an edited selection of my kind of core libertarian legal theory contributions. So, and all the writing is already online. It's on stephankinsella.com slash LLW. And then after that, I've got a few books I want to start working on in more, uh, um, uh, more seriously for the next few years. So I want to do a brand new book on intellectual property because the, the one I wrote before was like tw over 20 years ago, and I've learned some things since then. So I want to do a new one called Copy This Book. Um, I want to do a couple of compilations of like I want to do uh, uh, maybe with another one or two other editors, um, an edited selection of, of libertarian oriented anti IP writing, because there's no book on that right now. Um, and a couple of things like that, a couple of anthologies, things like that. Um, one day I might do a short 100, 120 page uh, summary of Hoppe's uh, political theory and social theory. I'm not sure. That's, that's, that's on my bucket list. Um, that would be that would be a good read. And also, yeah. I am toying with the idea of doing a companion or a, a follow up to the, the Michael Malice wrote a book uh, recently or edited a book uh, called uh, the Anarchist Handbook. The Anarchist Handbook. Yeah, I and I've that. come yeah. I've come up with a list of uh, other writings that he didn't include, which which would be nice to include. Um, so maybe like a volume yeah. two of that or, or a follow up. Yeah, so there's a, a there's a lot of anthologies from the left uh, anarchist Correct. perspective. It Correct. would be nice to have another one from the right anarchist perspective. Yeah, and Michael's is good. It's it's not completely. He does have some left stuff in there, but it's not dominated by that. Uh, mine would have almost none of that. It would be all <laughs> solid right or, or right stuff. Um, maybe one or two tinging left, but not that much. So some things he left out that would be a good a good follow up to that. So that's a possibility too. If I, the problem is honestly the problem with that one is, is copyright because you know if you self publish a book like that. You need to go to Amazon. And you need to prove to them every chapter in there you have the copyright permission. And if there's like 20, 30 chapters in there, you've got to chase down – no, maybe say one third of them are public domain because they're so old, but there's a good half of them that are still under copyright. And so maybe half of those easily you could find the author and get permission. But what if something's published in 1950 and you don't even know who the – who the heirs are anymore right? or is out of print i mean it's just again copyright is a huge problem I and amazon won't publish it yeah. amazon won't publish it unless you can prove that you have cleared the copyright so that could be a barrier that's why i prefer to write my own stuff and i don't need to clear it and what's your uh, book on uh, your original book on intellectual property called against intellectual property it was really a long mon a long article for the journal of libertarian studies in 1998 or something like that and then the mises institute uh, republished it as a monograph, um, a short booklet in 2008. So it's called Against Intellectual Property. And I stand by everything in it, more or less. Uh, I would tweak a few things, but there's additional ways of arguing and additional evidence that I've um, come across in the, in, the, in the 20 years since it came out.
I'll be sure to link your website and then have that under as well. So yeah, and all this is under yeah. st- under my my IP devoted site, which is c4sif.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. C4s the number four c4sif.org slash a <clears throat> excuse me AIP, which means against intellectual property. It's all there. Awesome. Um, who do you think is the most uh, underrated Austrian econ- uh, economist? Mm, probably Jeffrey Herbener. Um, he is a genius. I'm sorry, Jeffrey Herbert. Yeah, Jeffrey Herbert. Um, uh, he was one of the co-editors of the quarterly of the Review of Austrian Economics. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and he's he's up there with the. I, I think of there. There's a few core Austrian thinkers who I think of as high Austrians because they're heavily praxeological. And by that I mean they're not just correct and good. Uh, like Walter Block's a good example. He's he's great, but there's a few that really really rely heavily in their analysis on praxeology. Like they 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 use Mises's, um, they, they go deep into prax. They don't just give it lip service. They actually use it in their reasoning. So the core ones there would be um, well Rothbard was one too. Although Rothbard was heavily Aristotelian, so. The the more Misesian ones like Hoppe are even more into the praxeology and the and the um, and the means in framework, and that would be say Hoppe, Guido Holzman, Joe Salerno, um, and Jeffrey Herbener. Um, I know there's a few others I'm, I'm I'm missing out, and there's a younger crop that are good too on this, like uh, Matt Mahai and uh, some of these guys. But from the from the guys I really learned from, um, that really that really uh, are not just like. Good fellow travelers and good supporters and good Austrians, but like the ones that have developed and really rely upon praxeological theory. Um, and so I think of all those people, Herbert is the one that um, is a little quieter and, and he's not quite as well known as some of the others, but maybe Herbert. Right. Um, do you think the current or do you think the Austrian mythology is currently gaining or losing ground? I think Austrian economics is um, on better ground now than it's ever been, as far as I can tell. Um, it's not just some truncated thing that only five people know about, like it was maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, the Ron Paul Revolution and the expanded number of libertarians, look, the Mises Caucus and the Libertarian Party, things like that. More and more people are aware the, 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 the Mises Institute is well known now. It's not dominant anymore because it was the only one on the internet, you know, at a certain time. But now, now there's lots of other groups, but it's still well known and it's entrenched as as a main player. Um, I think the the one problem with it is that uh, you have like two bran- two essentially two branches of Austrian economics. One is the Misesian branch. Um, uh, that's the uh, the sort of Manger, then Bombavark, then Mises branch, then Hoppe and the, and Rothbard and all these guys, uh, the Mises Institute version, which is praxeology, I think of it. Then the second branch is the softer, more uh, Wieser, uh, Hayek, Kersner, uh, George Mason University branch of Austrian economics, um, which I think is is not is not really. Um, I think they're distinct. And I think that it, there's there's some flaws in that approach because uh, they they they've they uh, veered from praxeology, um, they strayed from praxeology. So I think it's a different approach. It's more based upon the market process and uh, knowledge problems and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> Do you think and, empiricism is useful? I mean, I'm not an economist. Uh, so I, I I I'm reluctant to speak too definitively on this stuff, but. I tend to think not much um, because economic analysis has to proceed basically according to the way Mises lined it um, by analyzing the implications of human action in sort of a, um, a ceteris paribus way with in a verbal manner. Um, there are limitations to the empirical method because of the nature of value. Um, so I think that empirical things can help illustrate it can be help. It can be useful pedagogically to help illustrate our propositions. You know, like if we if we claim that um, the reason there's unemployment is because of various government interventions, like the minimum wage, um, because we know deductively what the minimum wage must do. 
Um, and so we can point to historical examples to illustrate that point to help people understand and grasp it. But the, what they're trying to grasp is really an a priori or deductive point. Um, and it, so if you use, and most people, a lot of people could conflate economics with finance and with entrepreneurship. You know, they think, oh, you know, it's, it's, the old, it's the old complaint. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? I mean, economics is not about predicting the future. Um, you can use it as a policy tool. Like you could say, look, if you understand economics, then you know that if you favor human prosperity and freedom and peace and cooperation and all that, then these policies are inimical to that because economics tells you this. You know, you know, your your minimum wage is not going to make people better off. It's not going to help the poor. It's going to make them worse off. Economics tells you that. So it can be used to help guide policy, to help criticize law. When you have a bad law that's causing problems, economics can help you help you in a policy manner. But I don't think – it's not going to help you get rich on the stock market really, except in general ways. Like if you understand uh, that inflation is coming because the Fed is inflating the money supply. So you, know, you, can, you can have some general things like that. But, um, but I don't think that uh, – I mean economics tells you that the reason entrepreneurs are successful is because they are better at forecasting the future. How and why they're better is not an economic insight. No, I don't think anyone knows to be honest. It, it, Mises just called it an unteachable art, and he just he called it the understanding or verse to him in, in German. So economic, knowing economics won't make you have better forecasting ability um, as, as a pure entrepreneur. Um, so that, that'd be my answer for that. What do you what What do you think is the best way to counter the state? Or, or is the best way to counter the state by subverting its means of establishing control through the political economy? I guess that's an ag the question. I think, that's, question. I think yeah. that's an activism question. Like, uh, what what can we do to achieve more liberty and limit the the baleful effect of the state? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure we can do anything, to be honest. Um, I mean, one answer I have is just wait, but libertarians don't want to hear that. Because I do think things will get better. I think we're in the infancy infancy of the human race. We're still primitive. We don't think we are because we have spaceships, but <laughs> we are. We're still cavemen, and we act we act like that. Um, and we still have superstitions, and we have stupid traditions, and um, and like democracy <laughs> and religion. Um, so I, I think that the human race will improve. Now, the one thing I do think has happened, like I don't I don't think past you know I don't think libertarian advocacy is really going to do it because there's only one percent of us or even less that are interested in this kind of stuff so people are never going to be interested in hearing our lectures on economics or on political theory they just they have other hobbies you know so i don't think that's what's going to do it and even if you persuaded 15 percent of the population tomorrow then you know in 10 years it'll be back to one percent you know um so uh but i do think bitcoin has a chance of doing this because if bitcoin does succeed in the way some of us hope it will eventually uh, 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 it will, uh, supplant the, the the fiat dollar, fiat currencies, and that will ruin the that will end the ability of the state to uh, deficit finance, which is how they rely upon their massive spending now, right? Because they can't tax people enough to do it, so they just they just inflate to do it. But if they don't, if people don't use their money, they can't do that. So I have a feeling that Bitcoin is going to put the government, the state, on a huge leash. Uh, on a huge budget, it's going to restrain their ability to spend, and that will mean an immense increase in human freedom. So I think Bitcoin itself is the, probably the greatest single thing that's emerged in, in, in the modern times that can actually put a big damper on, um, on, on, on the state's uh, intrusion into our lives. Um, I'm all in favor of education and trying to understand things, but I do it more to understand and to – just advanced theory, just like someone who's a, I don't know, a Jane Austen scholar <laughs> or, or Shakespeare scholar, you know, that's their that's their avocation or their intellectual pursuit, and they do it to understand and to or a physicist or a mathematician or a poet, whatever. Um, so I think there's there's a distinction between understanding political theory and coming up with justifications for what's right and wrong, but don't confuse don't don't delude yourself that just figuring this out is going to change the world. Uh, you might change a few minds, and you might advance the theory among that discipline of people interested in it. Um, I don't think the Libertarian Party, which I'm a member of for a few years because of 
the Mises Caucus people joining it. I don't think electoral politics is a way to achieve much. I don't think court challenges can do very much. I'm in favor of doing what you can. Um, I don't think voting can do much because democracy is, is 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 democracy systematically is designed for the power of the state to keep growing and for corruption to keep growing and for short term short short high time preference thinking to dominate and for corrupt politicians to be elected. Um, so I think that the best way to achieve liberty in your personal life is to is to look at the rules around you, look at the constraints, and to try to succeed and become as as rich as possible. I don't mean in monetary terms, but basically have as, as much insulation and power from reputation and your social status and your money and whatever that you can basically, you know, get some immunity from the state's depredations. Um, um, and also, I think that the, the advancement of technology over time uh, in free trade, international trade, eventually, hopefully the world will, you know, the human race will keep evolving and we will outgrow the state. So I, that's my hope. Uh, so back to the topic of economics briefly, um, what do you think is the best thing you can take away from the Chicago School of Economics? Well, they're, you know, their common sense reasoning on basic issues is by and large good. I mean, one of the books that helped, uh, I won't say convert me, but helped open my eyes was uh, Milton Friedman's uh, Capitalism and Freedom, and also his book Free to Choose. <clears throat> Probably I would have more disagreements with that now reading it because I would be more on, on alert to the deviations from Austrian methodology and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I think in the beginning I was, I was, uh, I was more uh, enamored of his ar arguments. I can't remember if it's in that book or somewhere else, but his arguments for um, for a voucher system and education, and for a negative income tax. I mean, on the surface, they make sense in a basic economic sense. You can say, well, you know, the government's inefficient in everything they do. So instead of having government-run schools, just give people a, a voucher. But politically, that's a bad idea. I think I'm a totally opposed to the voucher system and, and educational choice now because it's basically I don't I don't think the form of state welfare matters that much, and the voucher system would basically expand state welfare. So you know, instead of subsidizing 80 percent of the students, it would subsidize 100 percent of the students. That's not good, and it would, it, by doing that, you would also uh, further uh, further weaken and erode the independence of the private schools because now they would effectively be public schools. So I'm totally opposed to the voucher system now. But economically, it makes sense. I, his arguments economically, they just ignore the political problems with it. Um, same thing with the negative income tax. Uh, but most of the stuff in there, like the common sense reasoning, just basics of, you know, if you just apply supply and demand reasoning in a consistent way to things like the minimum wage or pro union legislation or tariffs or high taxes. And, and you know you understand the need for private property rights, which Friedman does. So I guess the, the best thing about the Chicago School is their pro-free market. Um, the, the problem is they have this idealized view of it, which is not realistic. And so then they say that there's market failure because the real the real world doesn't comply with their idealistic version of it. So we so the government is justified in 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 having some interventions to fix it and to make it like antitrust law. Um, and uh, eminent domain to you know when there's holdout or free rider problems and, and intellectual, intellectual property, property yeah. intellectual property. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the big problem with it. Um, uh, like like Friedman's two of the worst things Milton Friedman wrote, I think. Number one was his uh, his essay about the method of economics, like his logical positivism. But that's not, as far as I recall, that's not in his basic capitalism and freedom. He's just talking about applying simple reasoning to to problems like supply and demand. Um, his, so his methodology doesn't permeate that, that I can recall. Uh, and the second thing he – his Milton Friedman's argument for libertarianism was, was horrible. I actually don't think he meant it, but this is what he, all he could articulate. What he wrote was – it was in Liberty Magazine, if I recall. He wrote that the reason we have to have like a libertarian society – in other words, the government can't – shouldn't regulate our lives – so much like the like the status want want them to do is because of a lack of knowledge. In other words, 
you can't know what the good life is for someone else because of a lack of knowledge about that because you can't know what's the best way for them to live their life. So therefore, it's wrong to force them to live the way you think life should be lived. <clears throat> the problem with that is it implies that if you did know, you could regulate what they would do. Right. And most people, most average people think they do know because they're very provincial and parochial, right? They they have their own little way of doing things. And they think, oh, of course, people, I don't do drugs. Other people shouldn't do drugs. So uh, they don't have Milton Friedman's sober awareness of our of, of of the limitations of our reason. Most people think, well, I know that drugs are bad. Look at it. Look, it destroys lives. So okay, Friedman, but we do know that drugs are bad. So we should outlaw drugs, right? So that's not a good defense of libertarianism. A real defense has to be more the Randy and principle type, like even if drugs are bad for you, you have a right to do drugs because you're not violating someone's rights. It's sort of the principle, non-aggression principle approach to things, right? Uh, or as Ayn Rand argued, like um, uh, you know, I think she argued this, or some of her followers argued this, like antitrust law is not justified, not just because the economic reasoning behind antitrust law is flawed. Like uh, I think uh, D.T. Armentano, D.T. Armentano, and Tom DiLorenzo, both Austrian economists, they pointed out. Hell, even Robert Bork and others have pointed this out. Um, cartels are extremely hard to to maintain. So even if you allowed collusion on the free market and you abolished the antitrust laws, it's really hard to do price fixing. It's hard to have collusion that's successful. Uh, predatory price cutting really doesn't work. You know. So all the alleged harms of allowing people to do what they want just really don't exist in most cases. Um, but, but that's to me the secondary argument. The, the Randian argument, the principle of libertarian argument is that even if it does hurt consumer welfare for two businessmen to set – collude and set prices, they still have a right to do it because um, it doesn't violate anyone's rights. So to me, that's the better approach, and the same thing with… Like discrimination, like we point out, like you don't need laws against uh, saying you can't – employers can't discriminate based upon sex and race because any employer who discriminates based upon sex and race is going to suffer uh, financially in the marketplace because, say, you're restricting your pool of customers or your pool of employees to a subset of the whole pool, and that's going to bid your cost up basically or reduce your sales. But some people are willing to pay that price because they're racist, okay, or they're bigoted. I still think there will be a tendency to erode that because it would be costly, and over time, people don't want to pay these costs. But the fundamental reason why these laws are unjust is not because they're not needed. It's because people have a right to discriminate. Right. Same thing with the minimum wage. You could say that, well, you can't pay someone a wage less than subsistence because they can't survive or… Or there's always a supply and demand between the employers and the employees in a free market, and so they're going to tend to be able to bargain for their own wages anyway, blah, blah, blah. The real reason you have a right to pay someone a wage less than the minimum wage is because it does not violate someone's rights to make them an offer. Like if the minimum wage is $10 and I offer you $0.50 cents to do this for me, I'm not violating your rights by making you that offer because you're free to turn it down. And the reason people say you're not free is because they have a non-libertarian view of freedom. We view freedom as being infringed and liberty as being infringed only by acts of violence because your right is only the right to the physical integrity of your body and property that you own. So aggression is the only way to violate that. Force is the only way to violate rights. These guys have a looser concept, and they think that there's such a thing as economic coercion, right? So, <clears throat> you know. If I say, well, you don't have to take that job, they'll say, but you do have to take the job because you need to survive. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you don't have a right to survive. You don't have a right to other people's money. So it's still up to you whether to choose to take this offer from this employer. Anyway. Great. So what is your uh, what do you think of the uh, the recently popularized saying Cthulhu swims left? Say again? Uh, the saying Cthulhu swims left. <laughs> uh, Cthulhu is that monster from Lovecraft. Uh, I, I don't follow all this stuff. Okay, Cthulhu so uh, I don't I don't know the meme or the the expression. The meaning, and I've heard Jeff Dice say this before. It's uh, uh, institutions that aren't specifically uh, anti left wing uh, eventually become left wing or become woke, essentially. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's interesting. Um, 
here's what I would say. Um, I define left kind of the way Hoppe does. Leftism is an egalitarian view of human nature, and that's how they that's how they they gear their policies. And the right is essentially realistic, like it understands that for a private human society, there's going to be natural hierarchies and natural authority, and uh, natural segregation and natural discrimination, things like that. Whereas the left wants to ignore this reality. Um, and Hoppe has an essentialist definition of socialism being not just the centralized ownership of the means of production, but in general, it's, it's the institutionalized interference with private property rights. So basically, the state is socialist, and socialism implies the state. They're kind of the same thing, and crime is the same thing, except for private crime, which is not institutionalized. So public crime, the state, and socialism are all the same, and I would say leftism, in a sense, is bound up with all that. Um, so really, we're talking about statism. And in today's world, that's basically the democracy. So I would say that states, leftism, they do have a tendency to keep growing and getting worse and worse and making things worse until it collapses, and then who knows what comes out of that. Um, as far as leftism itself, maybe in a more narrow sense, I do think that the left has, has been winning the culture war for 50 or more years, um, and it's sad. And I think part of the reason is that um, – the more culturally conservative, if you want to call it that, types have just been cowed into uh, being on the defensive. And when they try to go on the offensive, because there's a cost to be paid by bucking the, the dominant you know, intellectual trends, which are lefty, you tend to get people that are the losers because the people that have a lot to lose don't want to buck those trends first. So you tend to have people that don't have much to lose are the first ones to buck the trends and come up with a, a positive counteroffensive. And they tend to be the icky types, you know, the ones who use the word cuck, and they, they're the alt-right, and they're kind of a little too chummy with these guys that want white European kind of family structures. And you know, part of that's because of some backlash against this, the the implicitly anti-white and anti-male bigotry of the institutionalized laws and regulations that the left has gotten enacted. So there's a backlash, but the backlash is spearheaded by a lot of unsavory characters quite often. So, and that tarnishes us who want to fight too, because then they the left identifies with us them and paints us with a broad brush. And you know, so it's messy. And um, I think the only way to get out of that in a way is to put yourself in a position in society where you're unimpeachable and you're uncancelable. Like you know, if you have a lot of social standing, a lot of money, your character is unimpeachable. You can just say what you want. You know, instead of being cowed by people that want to try to cancel you, like if you say, "I don't think that men can't be women," I don't. I just don't believe that. I'm sorry. Um, instead of being cowed if someone says, "Oh, you're a transphobic bigot," just say you're an asshole. Fuck off. Walk away. You don't have to put up with it. But if you're weak, or if your job depends upon you know something, and and you, and you're dependent upon your job because you don't have any savings, then you have to be careful what you say. So the solution is to aspire to excellence, right? So that you can say what you want and you, you and so that you can't be canceled. <laughs> and you can be, don't have to join the icky guys in fighting against this stuff. You can be part of a positive uprising against the left. I don't know. If, I think I'm diverting from the Cthulhu leans left, but um <clears throat> it is it is a symptom and it's a problem. I think that was really well said. Um, so I want to make sure we get to this. This is you know the one year anniversary of the most tragic event in human history. Um, <laughs> happy happy January sixth day by the way. Yeah yeah happy January sixth. Um, so what are your thoughts on um, how you know the reactions to that? I guess generally speaking, and you know how the media has responded and even how libertarians have responded to it. Uh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't noticed. I mean, I, I don't know. Have the, have the beltway libertarians been kind of sucking up and the day of, they definitely were, I think they kind Som of somberly yeah. saying this is a horrible, I mean, this January 6th thing has become a litmus test where your mainstream person, they will sort of pose it to you. Like 
if you don't answer the right way, they're going to exclude you from polite society. And again, I don't play these games. I mean, I've had a few of them do this to me and they'll say something like, what do you think about January 6th, you know? And I'm like, well, let's think about it analytically. Um, um, who owned that building? <laughs> You know, so I look at it from a libertarian, proprietarian point of view. It's like, well, I don't think that the guys that work there own it because they're a bunch of criminals. So, what? So, what? What crime did the guys people commit? Uh, trespass, yeah, but that that implies that they were using someone else's property without their permission. Uh, I would say, if anything, the taxpayers are the true owners of that property, and they're not committing trespass by using it. I mean, I don't think these guys are some kind of libertarian heroes that went in there. I think they were rabble and they were just uh, conspiracy nuts and whatever. Uh, and I don't think it was prudent to do that because it didn't do anything good. It, it gave an excuse to the state to crack down. But I don't think it was like a dark day for democracy or some horrible thing. I think it was kind of funny, to be honest. One of the best I was things Trump, the whole time. <laughs> yeah, one of the best things Trump did was to um, discredit the state to a degree, you know. Um, that's one reason they hate him because he's credit to the state. I mean, he's made it more and more look like the laughing stock that it is, and also the, the deep state, just uh, hypocritical, uh, you know, power hungry cabal that it is. So I don't think Trump did that intentionally, but <laughs> he helped do that. So that's one good thing he did. So no, I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I, most libertarians I know just look at January sixth as a as a big nothing burger. Um. I haven't heard too many Beltway types uh, joining with the establishment in condemning it, but maybe they have. They definitely were the day of. I mean, you'd expect people like Justin Amash to do that, you know. But like, uh, there were probably some uh, anarchists in there as well. Um, so <laughs> this is a silly question, but I'll ask you anyway because I'm sure you'll give a good answer. If I believe in argumentation ethics, does that mean sleeping people or babies don't have rights because they can't argue their case? No, that's. I don't think that's a. That's not a stupid question. It's not an insincere question. I think it's. It's trying to understand um, um, how how the theory would apply because the, the on its face the theory would seem to indicate that rights come from arguing. Um, I don't think the the theory doesn't imply that rights come from arguing. The theory. Poses arguing as a as was like an as a thought experiment to illustrate why we have rights, but it doesn't mean that like like you're 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 22 years old and you've never you've never participated in an argument so therefore you don't have rights yet. It's not like a right of pat. It's not like you have to argue with someone and then you get rights. Um, I think the whole purpose of argumentation ethics is to explain why any political ethic other than libertarianism cannot be coherently justified. So if you come up with an argument for we should have socialism, argumentation ethics shows that that argument is inherently contradictory. Therefore, it can't be true um, <clears throat> because anyone arguing would have to presuppose peace and the, the kind of basic norms that are compatible only with libertarian higher norms. Um, but the argument recognizes that the people that have rights are fellow humans that have the characteristics that the, that people in, that are participants in argumentation could have, which is rationality and the ability to communicate. So then the question is, what kind of creatures have that right? Like, for example, someone sleeping, everyone, everyone participating in argument is a human being, which has a real biological body and sometimes needs to sleep. So when you're arguing about what or having a discourse about what norms are justified, which ones we should adopt in society with each other, um, you're trying to come up with norms that are compatible with our nature because everyone there has a nature and have a sim roughly similar nature. That is that we're human beings with bodies and li living in a world of scarcity, right? Um, and we have rationality, and we all have self-preservation as our goal. We all need sustenance to survive, and we, we all need to sleep to survive, right? We're trying to come up with a rule that is the rule that will apply outside of the argument, not just during the argument when you're awake. So you're trying to come up with a rule that applies in general to human life, which means like you know, a year later when you have a dispute, a certain law will govern that dispute, and the law itself has to be compatible with the political norms that you could justify in argumentation. But the law governs humans all the time, even when they're sleeping. 
Um, so then the question is, how would that extend to babies or, or people that are, that are mentally defective or people that are comatose? Um, and I don't know if argumentation ethics gets you exactly there. Then it becomes a practical thing, uh, a practical case of judgment, like saying, well, the, the essential nature of the people that rights apply to are the types of people that could engage in discourse. That is humans that have rationality. So then the question is, well, does that apply to babies? Because they have the capacity to develop into rational beings, but they can't do it yet. And I think most people in society would include them within the category of rational adults or rational humans that have rights uh, because they're going to develop into that. And furthermore, while they're doing that, their parents are in essentially their caretakers and can decide for them and protect them, and, and they can assert their rights on behalf of the child. That's how I look at it, and I think you could augment the argumentation ethics approach of Hoppe with some insights of Lauren Lemaski in his book Persons, Rights, and the Moral Community, where he tries to argue from – I think it's more of a contractarian approach to rights, but he, he, he establishes in his argument rights for adult rational humans, and then he says, well, what about – these defective people or these infants or these comatose people, and he, he has an argument he calls piggybacking, like they, they, they contractual in a social contract kind of way. They, contract, they piggyback on the rights of normal – the normal case of humans, the adult case of humans um, by having the social community attribute these rights to them. Um, you can think of it like a burden of proof thing, like, like in the abortion argument, we're never going to solve scientifically – when a fetus gets rights, you know, it's not going to be at three months and three days or something like that. Um, but what we say is, well, we sort of know the endpoints. We know that like an 18 year old kid has rights, and we we assume that a baby has rights, and therefore we assume that a nine month old fetus has rights because it's not that much different than the baby. But we don't assume that a one day old zygote right right after fertilization has rights because it's it's just got nothing in common with with it doesn't have any rationality. It can't live on its own. So somewhere between fertilization and birth, we are going to attribute rights to this. And to be on the side of caution, to err on the side of caution, we want to move the line a little bit earlier. So maybe late-term abortions would be considered to be a type of um, a type of wrong. Although personally, I don't think it should be outlawed because of other considerations. Like such a law would require too much invasiveness into the personal sphere. I would look. At, I would. I would. My solution is to put the jurisdiction on the mother uh, and the and the and the family. So and it, it, so they're the ones that enforce the law and make up the law and interpret the law themselves. They have the jurisdiction because you can't give it to any outside group. That's my solution to this. But the point is, in a similar way, we might attribute socially – like erring on the side of caution out of respect for human life and the capacity of human life to develop and for what the person once was if they have a coma or something like that uh, and how close they are to us, like if they're, if they're mentally retarded. We might on err on the side of caution and human decency and out of respect for human life, give them the same protections almost as a fiction. Um, so I think that's the only thing that could ever happen. That's that's how it has to be, uh, because you do have these kind of gray area cases. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people on the server, myself included, a while back, you know, not understanding argumentation ethics is like a, it's very it's a very abstract concept, and it's like. If you hear about it, you're not going to really understand exactly what it means. Uh, but I think the, way, the question I, about babies is... I found page 173, by yeah. the way. I've got it called up. Yeah, I was about to read that too. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the quote is. Go ahead if you got it. Oh uh, Yeah, I'll go ahead and just read the quote from him. Um, a member of the human race who is completely incapable of understanding the higher productivity of labor performed under a division of labor based on private property is not properly speaking a person, but falls instead the same moral category as an animal of either oh. the harmless sort uh, to be domesticated and employed as a producer or consumer good or to be enjoyed as a free good or the wild and dangerous one to be fought as a pest. Right. Uh, oh, that's that's good. I thought I thought he was going to go with something else. Um, that's yeah. interesting. Um, I'd have to read around this to get the full context, but my, my guess is this is roughly compatible with Hoppe's written before, um, which is where he talks about. Um, I don't think he's talking there about uh, babies and things like that. I think what he's talking about is the choice of people to respect rights or not. Um, so he, I've got this post on my site 
stephancasella.com slash LLW. It's, it's called, uh, I think he, he calls it treating aggressors as technical problems. So basically, when you envision um, the, the libertarian rights as being those that could be agreed upon by rational uh, humans of goodwill in an actual peaceful discourse, right? So they have to be compatible with peace and those pre presuppositions. It doesn't mean everyone's got to play the game. Someone might refuse to play the game. So if someone refuses to mutually recognize your rights and to, and to admit that you have rights just like they, they claim rights for themselves, then they're putting themselves uh, uh, in, in, in the position of being like, like an animal would be to you, like a pure threat. Like a hurricane or disease or a storm or starvation or, or, or a drought. Um, so in the world, we face these technical problems, which we have to deal with. Like th there are challenges to living <clears throat> other than the danger posed by other humans, which we seek to reduce by laws that we all agree on that most people agree to respect. Um, and the ones that don't are treated as outlaws, and we have to deal with them like – from our point of view, they're no, they're no different than a lion or a tiger or an animal, which is a danger to you. So you treat them as a technical problem. So it's not a moral problem. It's a technical problem. So how to deal with them is not a moral one because they're not, they're not amenable to reason. They don't want to listen to reason. They're not willing to respect your rights. Uh, you're not going to persuade them because they don't want to hear it. They won't step into the arena of discourse, which would require them to accept your, your, your equal moral, moral status with them, right? So if they won't do that, then they're just, they've just become a technical problem, which is just the problem of criminal justice or law enforcement. What do you do with the 1% of people that are going to be outlaws and they're going to be um, – you have to treat them like they're animals. They're crafty animals, and we have to come up with a system to try to, to combat them and to defend ourselves. You can use locks, and you can use guns. You can hire security forces. You can have a, a justice system which catches them and punishes them and sends a message. Uh, you can ostracize them. Uh, but you know, in the end, the, the real solution is the fact that these people tend to be poorer. They have less re resources and means because they're not part of the division of labor society, so they, they, they lose out from that. So they tend to be uh, – have less ability to do harm than we have the ability to defend ourselves, uh, although unfortunately because of the way entropy works, it's easier to destroy than to create, so they can do a disproportionate amount of damage. Um, I, I suspect that's what he's getting at there, but I'd have to read it in more detail. Yeah, I remember pondering on that last time I read it. Uh, I, I'm certain he doesn't mean that yeah. infants don't have rights or something like that. No, he doesn't mean to. I think, I think you pretty much nailed it, if I remember right. Um, I think that was the context. But um, so what is your opinion on moral error theory? Moral error theory? I don't recall what that is. You'd have to familiarize me with it. Uh, yeah, if you got if you could clarify, then I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, we are starting to run out of time, but you know, uh, I'll ask you last last you know one or two questions. Sure. Um, so, besides those of uh, Mises and Rothbard, uh, what are some key works for understanding Austrian econ and libertarianism? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would refer to a couple of bibliographies and co collections of recommended works that I and others have come up with. So if you go to my website, stephancasello-llw, look for the greatest libertarian books. I have a post there which links yeah. to an article on Lou Rockwell and plus some, some other stuff with some, some suggestions. And it also links to a, a couple of bibliographies by Hoppe on anarcho-capitalist writing and David Gordon and Lou Rockwell on, I think, um, anarchist or market market – anarchist writing something like that um some of the key books um say repeat the question again or what what are some key works besides those of, of mises and rothbard for understanding austrian economics uh and obviously well, Austri economics is one lesson and another good one too for understanding yeah well hoppa would hoppa's I would uh, hop as a theory of socialism and capitalism and his next book the economics and ethics of private property are essential uh, plus his yeah. kind of monograph pamphlet, um, um, Economic Science and the Austrian Method, I think it's called. Uh, so Hoppe, uh, plus some of the other Austrians I mentioned earlier, Salerno and Herberner, and um, um, I've got a couple of good posts 
on my website, which collect some of the writings of these guys and their their opponents on the Hayekian side on a couple of issues. One was on free banking, and one was on the homo- dehomogenization debate, which was separating Mises and Hayek. Um, and so I've got two posts in there. One's called the Great Fractional Reserve Debate. One's called the Great Dehomogenization Debate. Something like that. So you can look up there. Uh, as for other writings, um, well, I think actually Bastiat, the Law, is is really good. Um, sort of proto-Austrian. Um, Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson, is good. There's another really good short collection, uh, which is sort of unknown now, which which was really helpful to me when I was younger. It's called the Free Market Reader. And it's by Rothbard and Rockwell. It's a collection, of, an edited collection of, of a selection of some of their essays from the old free market reader newsletter that the Mises Institute used to publish. That's really good. And the free market reader too is not bad too, but number one is really good. You can find that. It's a really nice collection of kind of short articles, kind of like Freeman, Freeman magazine style articles, but written by Rothbard and Rockwell mostly, minimum wage, things like that. Um I'm trying to think uh, what else uh, on Austrian economics itself. I mean, I like a lot of the adjacent stuff. I like the stuff that goes into its its effect on law. So like Bam Bavark has some interesting stuff on on legal theory and his things called four four classic essays, something like that. It's hard to find, but I found it uh, on P- in PDF form. Um, <clears throat> um, Some of the the legal stuff, like Bruno Leone has a really great book called Freedom and the Law, which is influenced a lot by Hayek stuff, but not the you know some of the good the good the good Austrian stuff, except for the knowledge stuff too much. But Freedom and the Law is really good. There's another guy named Giovanni Sartori, another Italian legal theorist, who's got a book. I think it's called Liberty and Law or something like that. It's really interesting. Um, so I don't know. I, w- I would look at look at my other list that I mentioned of the greatest libertarian books, and uh, I've got lots of recommendations there. Randy Barnett's book, The Structure of Liberty, has got some good stuff in it. Uh, the Tannehills, The Market for Liberty. This is more political theory and legal theory, but a lot of it draws upon some Austrian insights. Yeah, for sure. Your link's definitely going to be – I'll definitely post that uh, in the video and uh, on our server. Uh, so uh, – Last question we'll do. Um, what do you think of rhetoric uh, of Roderick Long's uh, critique of uh, argumentation ethics? I'd have to revisit that. I think um, I, I know that when Hoppe came out with his argumentation ethics in nineteen, uh, well, he wrote a couple things on it in the in the Austrian Economics Newsletter. I think like in eighty five, eighty six, but like the first kind of full presentation in print i think was in 1988 in liberty magazine and there was about a dozen or 18 12 or 18 responses 12 or 15 responses to hoppa's argument by various notable libertarians at the time like david gordon roger long rasmussen and denoyal or one of them um rothbard tipor mccann most of them were either ambivalent or critical of the of the theory, except for Rothbard, who gave it full, in, full you know, f- a full endorsement. Um, Roderick, I I think his he, he wasn't completely critical, but he criticized he nitpicked some parts of it. The thing is, Roderick Long, who's brilliant and he's a friend of mine, um, he has come up with an argument. That I think is very similar to Hoppe's and, or, or aspects of it. So, in response to the criticism of natural law that, that Hume and Hoppe make, which is that you can't go from an is to an ought, which, which basically is the Kantian idea that you can have hypothetical imperatives or categorical imperatives, right? Hypothetical is an if then. But the problem is so, so you could say if you want to achieve peace and prosperity for humans. Economic reasoning and our knowledge of human nature tells us we should have these kinds of laws, right? Which is more of a consequentialist argument for libertarianism, which is perfectly fine. But it's not, but the natural law guys, they don't like the if then. They want to say you should do this, like as an absolute thing. So they want to make a categorical assertion, but they don't want to use Kantian reasoning to do that. They want to use natural law reasoning. So they want to go from an is to an ought to make a categorical assertion, which is a problem. 
Rothbard, I mean, uh, R- Roderick tries to get around this with this sort of in-between approach, a hybrid approach, which he calls – I'm not doing a hypothetical imperative. I'm not doing categorical. I'm doing an assertoric. And by assertoric, he means it's not an if-then because an if-then is not absolute because what if the if doesn't hold? Wait, what if you don't favor prosperity? He says it's a since-then. So he says that since you favor human prosperity… Then you should favor libertarian norms, okay? Which is exactly what Hoppe's argumentation ethics does in different language. Because Hoppe is saying, since you obviously favor peace and prosperity by virtue of participating in argument to discuss this very issue, therefore you should favor libertarian norms. So they're both since then statements. So I think Roderick is probably wrong in thinking that um, his approach is really incompatible with Hoppe's. A lot of the Aristotelians and natural law types like the Randians bristle at the idea of uh, of making comparisons between their approach and a Kantian approach because they – like Rand thinks of Kant as a skeptic and this idealist um, and um, an enemy of reason and all this stuff because she took the American interpretation of Kant. Uh, but really the structure of the way ha- uh, Kant – or at least Kant in the realistic tradition of Mises and Hoppe, the way he reasons is very similar to the way Rand – like Rand justified and defended some of her so-called axioms by which she meant undeniably true propositions like existence exists, there is consciousness, we're aware of something, A is A, the law of non-contradiction, these kinds of axiomatic truths. She took them to be undeniably true because to challenge them – would get you involved in a contradiction, and that's exactly how Mises argues. Like, you can't deny that human that humans act because denying it would be an act, right? And Hoppe argues uh, for various categories of human action, and his ethical his ethical theory is also the same way, saying that you can't argue for socialism because you're arguing for violence at the same time that you're supporting peace by engaging in discourse. So you're con- you're engaged in a practical contradiction. So the method of argument is the same. And for Roderick, I think that he likes the Aristotelian terminology and concept and, and that sort of approach as a philosopher. Uh, maybe he would have a coherent explanation of why they're really not compatible. But from my simplistic point of view, they're compatible because they're both a way of arguing to show that um, – that the the higher level political norms that we all favor as libertarians, like the libertarian norms Roderick favors, libertarian norms Hoppe favors, and that I favor, and Rothbard favors, and even Ayn Rand to an extent favors, um, they're based upon lower level norms, and Roderick just says, well, they're sense norms. They're they're norms that you you obviously do favor. Yeah, and that's what Hoppe says. You obviously favor them because you can only reach this question in discourse, which which has normative presuppositions. So – that's my personal approach that they can all be made compatible. They're just different languages. Look, if you imagine we ran into another species from outer space that got here on a spaceship, they figured out physics too. They're not going to have the same language or the same concepts. They're not going to have arrived at the concepts of, of relativity or physics the same way we did, but they're talking about the same reality. They have to be. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at the tail of the elephant. You're looking at the nose. Someone else looking at the trunk of the elephant. We're all describing the same reality. So I think it's it's no it's no mist- it's no uh, it's no surprise that different approaches that are basically common sense and reasonable tend to the same conclusions. So if you're a consequentialist, <coughs> you're going to tend to be a libertarian if you understand economics, right? And if you're if you're um, if you're a deontological type principled libertarian, you come up with the same conclusions because we're all talking about the same reality. And is Rand admitted? And believed in which I believe uh, the, the 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 practical is the moral is the practical. There's so there's no I don't think there's a conflict between consequentialism and a principled approach to libertarianism. I think they dovetail. Now utilitarianism is a different matter. The way I view it is the way Randy Barnett outlines in the introduction to his book The Structure of Liberty, which is not online unfortunately, but you can find it at b-ok.cc um, or the Z Library. Um, he what Randy lays out is he says, look, consequentialism, uh, which is his approach, I think is perfectly compatible with a deontological approach because the practical is the moral and vice versa. <clears throat> but utilitarianism, I view that as a subset of consequentialism, and it's a flawed one because it, it rests upon methodologically flawed 
Um, like if you think you can sum up utility, right? That's just wrong. But consequentialism broadly stated, there's nothing wrong with that because we're in favor of rights because they lead to good consequences for us, right? And the reason we oppose unjust or bad laws is because they have some effect. Like I wouldn't mind the tax law or the drug war if the government never enforced it and it had zero effect on my life. The only reason we oppose these bad laws is because they have consequences. So the reason we favor good laws is because they allow good consequences, which is that we can operate within our sphere, you know, our sphere of um, of life, and we can take free action and live our lives as we see fit. So I think it's natural to see that consequentialism dovetails, and likewise. So I think that this this the approach of even Rasmussen, who thinks he disagrees with with Hoppe and and Roderick Long, I had a similar conversation. Back in the day with another libertarian, uh, Roger Pallon, who's with Cato, uh, who's, I think, a semi-anarchist, but he's definitely a libertarian. But <clears throat> he studied under Alan Gaworth, who has a theory of rights, um, but he's a, he's a democratic socialist. But, but Pallon, Pallon took his argument. It's, it's called a principle of generic consistency, and he, 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 he reapplies it using… Economic insights that free market people have, and he he concluded that only libertarian norms can be justified according to this. Now there are some problems with that general approach, but it's getting at the right thing, and it's it's a it's a close cousin to the way Hoppe argues. And yet Pallon criticized Hoppe, even though Hoppe took Habermas's argumentation ethics, which is also Democrat socialist, and he re reworked it into a libertarian direction. So in a sense, Pallon and Hoppe are, are close cousins. They both took. A kind of transcendental type argument that Democrat socialist PhD advisors came up with to justify socialism, and they said, no, no, no. If you apply it correctly, you get libertarianism. So they should be allies, not um, not, not so dismissive of each other. Although I think Hoppe's criticism of, of Gerworth is correct, but as I wrote in my one of my articles, New Rationalist Directions in Libertarian Rights Theory, um, you can you can fix the mistake in, in Gerworth. And Pallon uh, by moving it in a slightly hoppy in direction, and it, then it works. So it's another – they buttress each other really. Anyway, that's a little bit of a digression, but I, it's a long-winded way of saying I think Roderick Long's astrotoric hypothetical <clears throat> is complementary to Hoppe's, and um, so I think some of his criticism of Hoppe are misplaced. All right. That was uh, a lot of fun. Uh I really enjoyed that. This is one of the more, uh, the more I guess, intellectual AMAs that we've done. Um, so uh, I'll send you the uh, recording uh, to this. Um, I'll email that to you. Uh, this should go up on our YouTube uh, within a day. Um, and uh, is there anything that you want to link to besides your website? Uh, some people that are interested in this, they may be interested in uh, a recent podcast podcast. Uh, feed I got started for the Property and Freedom Society, which is the uh, the um, paleo libertarian or, or Austrian libertarian group that Hoppe founded back in 06 in Turkey. <clears throat> we have annual meetings and we have speeches and uh, we've collect we've saved most of them and I've just started releasing them on a podcast feed. So go to propertyandfreedom.org and uh, you may find some of the talks there of interest. I'll link that as well and um, make sure you. Uh, uh, Stefan will be on uh, the Austrian economic server in two days, so make sure you guys see that as well. What, what are you speaking on with there? I think on decentralized versus centralized law, so legislation versus common law, that kind of thing. Yeah, they have all kinds of speakers uh, on the 8th and the 9th, so be sure to be there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, anything you want to, uh, anything else you want to plug? Nope. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Happy New Year, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Yeah, Happy New Year, Happy 1-6. Uh, thank you for coming. All right, the stream's ended. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. No problem. Have a good one, man. You too.